I will um, introduce myself. I'm going to let the, um, the panelists introduce themselves as well. I'm going to try to stay on mute for a lot of this since I know there's a lot of background noise here in Boston. Um, so we created this roundtable with the idea that the Make It Safe Coalition has had lots of opportunities for meetings and to work together on various legislative issues, which I'll let Tom talk more about. And then we most recently met the Walk the Talk Foundation, and we're just so impressed with the work they were doing on the um, DOD OIG report that they did and the recommendations that they made for congressional action that we thought this would be a really good opportunity to kind of look at sort of old business and new business all in one format with, of course, um, Whistleblowers of America having signed on to many of the Make It Safe Coalition or the MISC uh, Coalition letters of support to Congress. And we have also launched our own request for a office of the whistleblower um, to have an advocate similar to the um, OVC, the Office of Violence, the Office of Victims of Crime, sorry. Um, and for us to be able to have programs and funding similar to OVC for whistleblowers. Um, I've tried to reach out to the OVC myself several times. And although they, they do very important work with crime victims, such as domestic violence, sexual assault, they don't look at whistleblowers as crime victims in the same way we would like them to. So I've proposed that we have our own office. We've met with Senator Grassley and Senator Blumenthal, uh, their staff. I've pitched the idea to some House staffers as well. And I think that, um, you know, for our, from, for our perspective, um, and we're very uh, unique in our mental health approach, that we have more people um, able to assist with whistleblowers, not just with their legal issues, but also with the support and advocacy they need for their cases. So with that, I'm gonna um, ask Tom Devine to come on and give us a, about a 10, 15 minute update on what are some of the um, Make It Safe Coalition, some of the activities we've had over the last Congress and then um, I'll ask Francesca Graham to introduce herself and talk a little bit more about Walk the Talk. So, Tom, over to you. Tom, you're on mute. Thanks for inviting me, Jackie. And um, I guess my job this evening is to go over the legislative opportunities that we've been been fighting for. Uh, and there's really three that there's a lot of them that we have our fingers in are a draft draft legislation for Congress people who are senators who just want to introduce it, um, but not necessarily going to take root. Um, so I'll concentrate on the ones that, that I think are really serious. Um, and the main one that's an opportunity is legislation to overcome the government contractor whistleblower law. Uh, depending on the year, there's between two and um, three times more government contractor employees performing federal service than civil service employees. Um, you know, they're, they're acting as the federal government, but they're not civil service employees, they're contractors. And unlike the civil service, contractor employees really don't have too many due process rights. Um, they generally work for at-will at operations. Um, and so it's not like you, um, uh, for any action you want to take involving a contractor employee, you have to have an internal hearing and then an external hearing and all sorts of due process things. And if you've got problems with their performance, you got to put them on an improvement plan. And, and it's a lot of work to uh, retaliate against a federal worker. It's very easy to retaliate against a contractor employee because they, they're pretty much at will. Um, uh, 
because of that, Congress started to enact rights for these folks. Uh, it, um, the first major landmark um, was with President Obama's uh, 2009 stimulus law. The Republicans were so worried that it was going to turn into a big patronage corruption scandal uh, that they actually led the way for um, an effective bipartisan contractor law that was passed. Um, and it's one of the strongest whistleblower laws ever passed. But the problem with it, it was just for the stimulus funds. And so when those funds ran out, all the rights turned into pumpkins. Uh, and um, we needed to go the next step, which was to um, uh, act on that very successful experiment, um, which the, the, the stimulus was remarkably, surprisingly free of scandals and corruption. And the IGs um, credited the whistleblowers for a lot of that, for nipping problems in the bud. And so we got Congress to pass um, a government a law protecting all government contractor whistleblowers in 2012. Um, but, you know, that was 12 years ago. Um, and um, all reform laws, particularly those challenging abuses of power, need regular maintenance uh, or else they erode. Um, the folks who've got the power are in a relentless struggle to um, um, uh, create loopholes, hostile interpretations, find ways to circumvent them. Uh, and the laws become weaker and weaker over time if they're not maintained. Uh, you know, just like our bodies or our cars, you've got to maintain your rights too. Um, and with um, the COVID pandemic, um, we saw, well, actually members of Congress asked us to work with them, um, updating the government contractor law in anticipation of all the federal funds that would be spent. Uh, and when you ended up combining the COVID spending and uh, Build Back Better, the infrastructure, and then the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a big spending program for climate, climate change, um, we ended up with now with Obama, it was about seven hundred million dollars, seven hundred billion dollars of new spending. Uh, we've had about four and a half trillion dollars of new spending uh, in the last four years, and the government contractor law was not up to the challenge. Um, and so, you know, just with COVID spending alone, uh, the Inspector General of the Department of Justice uh, estimated a hundred, a hundred billion dollars of fraud uh, in COVID spending. Uh, and uh, we saw this as a um, you know, good reason to be pushing to update the contract law, but we weren't successful. Um, this time uh, it was completely partisan. Uh, it was more like um, you know, a democratic bill as opposed to a bipartisan uh, initiative. And partisan initiatives don't get very far in Congress. Um, uh, we kept pushing though, and this year, we kind of had a breakthrough. Um, uh, a virtually intact version, almost intact version of our original vision, unanimously passed the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee, Committee of Jurisdiction. Um, and that was after a lot of effort by the Make It Safe Coalition. And it's being proposed now as an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, which means that, um, uh, it's got a real chance of getting enacted. Um, there's a lot of work to do, and I'll go into that in a few minutes, but let me tell you why this is worth the work. Um, the changes, the key changes that would be in this legislation is first, it would protect um, fraud waste, whistleblowing against fraud waste and abuse in any government contract or grant. Um, currently, it doesn't cover international contracts and grants. Uh, and that means that now, the sort of corruption that we see in Afghanistan or Iraq with all the money that we, we send over there, uh, there's no protection uh, against fraud, waste, and abuse there if you blow the whistle. And um, this would close that loophole. Uh, secondly, the current law doesn't protect against blacklisting, uh, just against getting fired initially. Uh, and you know, I tell you, um, you know, getting fired initially is a really bad moment. Getting blacklisting is... Um, can be a lifelong end of your uh, professional calling. Uh, so it has to be covering those future operations, and this bill does. Um, a lot of times, um, 
contractors retaliated against whistleblowers because the feds told them to. <laughs> and the, uh, the feds are saying, hey, these contractors are kind of spoiling the party for everything we want to brag about. And so get rid of them. Um, and been told, if you want more federal funds, um, you better fire this contractor. You keep that person there, you're not going to get any money from us. Um, and the new legislation gives um, uh, authority to discipline government officials who order uh, retaliation. Um, one of the things most significant about it is it would restore court access. Something that's really significant about the contractor whistleblower law that doesn't exist um, for civil service employees is if they don't get a speedy administrative ruling, uh, they have the right to go to court and have their and defend their rights with a jury trial, uh, which kind of takes the politics out of. Um, um, uh, seeking justice and the administrative law system is very very vulnerable to political pressure um well in the fifth circuit court of appeals they the court said um you don't have court access because the way the law was written um, um uh, if you sign um an agreement as a prerequisite for getting hired by a contractor that um says in the event of a dispute um but your job, you'll have it resolved by a company-sponsored arbitration. Um, that's all you get. A company-sponsored arbitration means the arbitrator, the judge, is working for the company, and the company you know, is getting paid by the defendant, uh, and the company makes the rules for the arbitration. Um, it's you know, it couldn't be more of a, a kangaroo court. Uh, and um, in one judicial circuit in our country, that's all that whistleblowers get. Um, and so we need to restore the language to eliminate that precedent and overturn that judicial decision. Um, the new legislation would protect people uh, for walking the talk, refusing to violate the law. Um, uh, right now, they only have rights if they make noise, if they say, we shouldn't do that. Uh, but they have to obey it or else um, they, they're, they're proceeding at their own risk. They can't defend themselves. Um, uh, another provision in this is that it would protect the contractors, not just the contractors' employees. Um, a number of cases in our experience, um, the whistleblowers have been government contractors, not just the workers blowing the whistle on the contract. It's been the contractors blowing the whistle on the government. Um, uh, and uh, um, they don't have any rights to defend themselves if the government retaliates against them. Uh, and finally, um, this would close one of the most significant loopholes uh, in whistleblower rights, which is um, that contractors for the intelligence community, um, those who are CIA, um, NSA, National Security Agency contractors, similar ones, there's over 60 intelligence agencies, um, they don't have any rights under the government contractor law. Uh, they're a loophole. Um, um, and they can't defend themselves at all. And so people like uh, Edward Snowden was very sensitive to this. Um, he didn't have any rights, so uh, he worked through the system, so he had to leak it to the media. Um, this is very, very significant legislation. We have a fighting chance to get it enacted, um, and um, for any of you folks who want to help, uh, we need it. Um, we need to be uh, lobbying the Republicans for the rest of the, until the NDAA is passed, which is usually towards the end of the year. We have to get the Democrats to fight for it. We have to get the Republicans to support it. Uh, and I think we've proved with the committee unanimous vote that if we work hard, we can succeed. Um, but it's going to take intensified effort now for the final end game of this. Um, that's the main thing I wanted to talk about. Um, I'd also like to though, summarize um, a legislation that's, um, it's not legislation yet, but it's so important to all of us at the Make It Safe Coalition. Uh, and it's a public imperative with all the disasters and tragedies recently, which is to um, uh, overhaul and modernize uh, the air safety whistleblower law. It's called Air 21. Um, uh, and one of the pioneers of air safety whistleblowing, Carlene Pettit, is going to be, a, I think, the keynote speaker at Jackie's Workplace Promise Institute. Um, and I'll just kind of briefly list the things that um, this bill would do. When it was passed in 2000, again, it was, uh, it was like best practices. Uh, but now, this one's 
24 years old. Uh, and it's really become, um, it's gone from being a pioneer whistleblower lord, right, to kind of a dinosaur whistleblower right. Um, so what are the things that uh, our legislative vision would accomplish? One, increasing the statute of limitations to act on your rights from 90 days to three years, which is the current best practice. Um, adding in protection against gag orders as job prerequisites that would cancel your free speech rights or force you into uh, company arbitrations instead of your due process rights. Um, if you didn't get an administrative ruling uh, that's timely, uh, it would allow you to go to court and have your rights determined by a jury. Um, it's one of the last remaining laws that where you don't have what they call kick out. Uh, uh, if you don't get a timely administrative ruling, you can kick out your case to federal court and get a jury trial. Uh, it would close coverage loopholes. Uh, for example, if it's not a commercial, major commercial aircraft, like charter planes, um, the rules don't apply. Uh, it would give people the right to refuse to violate the law, which I talked about up, up, you know, on the other bill. Uh, it would give them a realistic chance to get temporary relief. These cases go for three to five years before you get a final ruling. And by the time you finally get a decision, maybe too late. And it's like your life's already destroyed. Um, you've lost your home, your family is falling apart, your professional credibility is ruined. Um, there needs to be a way to um, basically hold off the retaliation while you're defending yourself um, if you have a decent case. Um, and then what about all the people who lose by winning? They win their case uh, and they're still worse off than if they uh, remain silent. Uh, well, this legislation vision will give personal liability of the bullies, not just the company, but the individual bullies, they have something to lose, and punitive damages, um, which are particularly relevant for air safety violations. Um, it would add agency investigations by the FAA Inspector General, um, or the DOT Inspector General of whistleblower reprisal cases, see what they were trying to cover up. Mandatory posting of rights, and all of these rights would now be additive rather than substituted for what people currently have. Um, folks, that's the two main things that our, our coalition is focused on. Depending on election results, um, we need to upgrade and modernize the Whistleblower Protection Act for civil service employees. They don't have access to court or jury trials either. They don't even, unlike members of the military service, which Francesca is going to talk about, weak law, even that law um, allows you to defend yourself against a retaliatory investigation, a witch hunt not for civil service, federal workers. Um, um, uh, uh, we, we have a lot of work to do in the future and depending on the election results, we may have a scorched earth, pitched battle, um, final fight um, to defend the nonpartisan merit system for federal workers. Uh, President Trump wants to openly do what President Nixon tried to do in secret was something called the Malik Manual, which is to purge all the people out of the federal government who won't be um, mouthpieces of their puppets for him. Um, so that's sort of um, what's on the table currently and what I envision for the future. Um, and thanks for giving me a chance to share all this, Jackie. No, I appreciate that. And I appreciate how knowledgeable you are about all of this. So I'm gonna let um, Francesca Graham introduce herself and tell you a little bit about the Walk the Talk Foundation as sort of the newest discovery <laughs> we've had at the Make It Safe Coalition and some of the work that they're doing. Um, and I also wanted to remind people that um, the chat is open. So if you wanna connect, put your email address, tell us where you are. I've seen a bunch of attorneys um, have logged in. I know some of them have had issues, so I'm okay with us. Um, you know, on the sidebar over there with some of the chat information that's been going on. I think that's important too. Um, so Francesca, over to you. Thank you. All right, Jackie, you know, I really appreciate it. And so it's a pleasure to meet everyone virtually. And uh, Tom, I really appreciate that uh, that rundown. I'll especially be sure to, to pass that last piece to, uh, to Ryan since he's working with one of our major airlines. So- Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, definitely. I'm sure he'll be excited to hear that. Um, but yeah, so it's a pleasure to meet everyone. Uh, so I'm Francesca Graham. I'm the uh, Chief Operations Officer and Chief Advisor with the Walk the Talk Foundation. 
Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully this works. And we will be able to see what, hopefully we'll be able to see. Do, do, do. Uh, okay, that should work. All righty. Um, can everyone see the screen that I'm pushing right now? It should show how Senate Select um, uh, passes IA. Can everyone see that? Right now, I can just see your photo. You can just see my photo? Okay, then this might just not work. So I'm just going to stop this. I don't want to. I don't want to go go too crazy with all the technical glitches. All right, so I will just talk through this. Um, so Walks Talk Foundation. So we have been a foundation that was founded by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Ryan Swayze about three years ago. The purpose of the foundation is to uh, defend military whistleblowers. That's the that's the founding reason for the foundation. Um, but just like with most foundations that support the military DOD, we, we find ourselves doing a little bit more here and there on the edges, including uh, supporting um, DOD employees, whether federal or military, and then also uh, former service members and former federal employees as well, both with the whistleblower aspect of um, kind of our core piece of our foundation, but then also this other larger thing, which is the um, uh, just the administrative process or the administrative arm of the Department of Defense. And actually, we've been working with the D with the DHS with um, a little bit more within the last couple of months. So what is our mission? Our mission is to give the military member a voice uh, when and where they don't have one and guide them through the treacherous waters of whistleblowing. Um, and we are unique as an organization because we're one of the few organizations, I think we're one of the only organizations that actively advises uh, people who are whistleblowers and are still in the process of whistleblowing, or people who maybe even aren't whistleblowers, but they're trying to navigate the waters of the administrative investigation process, primarily military, like I said, but we do help civilian employees as well. So when I say the, the, the administrative process, we're talking boards of inquiry, we're talking the EO process, we're talking IG investigations, we're talking uh, non-judicial punishment, all of those things within the DOD and then also even within the DHS where you do not have um, full due process. You do not have the right to discovery. You do not have the right to actually see the evidence that's being used against you in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases. You cannot say, no, I dispute this evidence, whatever it is, based on these uh, false evidentiary gathering procedures. You just can't do those things within these administrative processes. Board of Inquiry is one of kind of the, the big areas where, where we see that. Um, and non-judicial process as well. And we also see a lot of um, uh, commands within both DHS and within um, the DOD who very much try to keep things out of the areas where you do have due process, such as a court martial. They're like, nope, we're not going court martial route because then you do have discovery, you have all these things. So, so that's, that's, that's what we do. We try to help people advise currently serving members as well as former service members, as well as DOD, DHS employees uh, to, to achieve whatever is their victory, wh whether their victory is revenge or their victory is to get promoted or their victory is to retire, or their victory is whatever their victory is, we try to help them with that. Um, the other big portion that our uh, foundation does is we do advocacy, advocacy specifically to uh, Congress on, the, on behalf of whistleblowers to work to change whistleblower laws um, so that uh, people just have more rights within the DOD and within DHS. So those are two big things, advocacy and advisement. Um, something that we recently uh, completed, it was about a, it was really, I mean, if it's a summation almost of two and a half, three years of, of casework, um, but it's also the summation of about eight months of really focused work of putting together a document, a proposal to Congress that um, proposes the disillusionment um, or dis dissolvement really of the current DODIG system and the creation of an IG body that's completely independent of the IG. So this is not 
um, taking the um, uh, forgive the, the rather tough enough taking the, the the pig that is the dodig and putting some, a different shade of lipstick on it to try to make it better no this is take the dodig and its subordinate entities the army ig the Marine Corps ig and all of those ig processes remove those entirely from the dod and have a separate office that is the ig for the dod the reason why we uh, are proposing this to Congress is um, we identified of uh, through over almost 400 different cases, or excuse me, 400 different uh, advisement situations that we've been doing for the last three years, and then gathering of 40, almost 40 case studies that we included in this proposal to Congress. We identified six major themes that um, just really stand out. Number one is that there's a total lack of due process and transparency throughout the entire process. Just like I was talking earlier, you do not have access, in these administrative processes, you do not have access to evidence per se. One of the, the an, a Coast Guard ensign that we're advising, she, her, she was told to give a sworn statement. She was given uh, Article 31 rights or, um, that were administered inappropriately. So she didn't really understand what was going on. She's just a O1. She doesn't know these things, right? And then she and she did the sworn statement over the phone. And she's when she requested a copy of her own sworn statement so that she could review it and make sure that the person taking the notes had done it in a way that was appropriate. Her chain of command has refused to give her the copy of her own sworn statement, and they're using it as evidence in taking her off the promotion list and all this others. I mean, it's just absolutely insane. And her crime, her crime was that she had a had an E4, a young sailor in her formation who um, alleged that she was sexually assaulted and the ensign reported it to three of her senior officers and they all flew her off and said, no, she, that doesn't sound like sexual assault to us. Um, so we're not gonna we're not gonna pursue this. So she kept pushing on it, and so that's her crime. So she might be out of Coast Guard by by middle of next year. Anyway, so total lack of due process and transparency throughout. It's just absolutely insane. Second big theme that we've noticed is the conflicts of interest due to inspectors general and command and point investigating officers subordination commit to commanders. You can have an IG office, your installation IG office, as an example. Or for me, as a as a retired Army 05, I've done multiple. I've been the investigating officer for multiple different 156 investigations. All of those investigations, um, I was subordinate to the commander who appointed me. So if I made a if I made a recommendation that 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 commander didn't like, and I kept going, I kept saying, well, this is still my recommendation. So I'm now endangering my own career and my own evaluation and my own and so there's just this constant conflict of interest even if you have ios or igs who are um well-natured and good-hearted good intended there's there's a lot of pressure on them to potentially not do what they're supposed to do third big theme is inadequate training of inspectors general command appointed investigating officers so your inspectors general so ryan swayze the the founder of walk talk foundation he was in the air force he was an inspector general at one point in his career and I think he said that for that um, for that job, they had uh, I think maybe less than less than uh, two weeks of training to to do that job. For me as an IO, uh, I never received any training. And at the time, I was still investigating uh, sexual harassment complaints and other things like this, uh, fraud complaints, and then some of the silly stuff like not showing up to formation on time, that, that nonsense. But just total inadequate training for the, for the impact of what these investigations can yield up to and including being involuntarily separated from the military with an other than honorable discharge, which means you can't even be buried in a military cemetery, which is, which is that's, that's heavy. Or you can even be um, uh, de in detention for 30, up to 30 days. So the fourth major theme is a lack of timeliness in investigations. There is no um, defined timeline for any investigation, and that's a problem. So you have people, as, as, as we've said before, the process is the punishment. You can have people who are being reprised against who will be under investigation for a year. During that year time frame, they can't go anywhere. They can't retire. They can't move. They can't get awards. They can't go to schools. They can't do anything. They're just in this horrible purgatory. Um, and it's just, it's insane. Number five is the link to military suicide and mental health crisis. Even as the DOD itself has admitted, 
as admitted. Um, I think I think it showed of 30, I think the 2002 statistics, Jackie, you pointed this out to me. Uh, I think it was up to 35% of the suicides in, in 2022. Uh, those people were under investigation at that time. So it's just, that's a pretty statistically significant number. And every single case that we've dealt with, including several I've spoken with recently, um, the investigations lead to an, an array of emotional trauma, including one gentleman I was talking to, who at one point was in a bathtub, had the gun to his head, and the only, th only reason he didn't kill himself is because he hadn't met his new son that, that had just been born, that he was not allowed to visit because he wasn't allowed to take leave. And then um, the last big major theme is this normalization of deviance, where even something as simple as FOIA complaints, FOIA complaints are supposed to be answered within 30 days or you're within a reasonable amount of time. We have FOIA complaints that haven't been answered for up to 800 days. And it's just this normalization of deviance where it's like, eh, well, that's no big deal. Eh, that's no big deal. And it's those types of things that we see, as, as Ryan wrote in a, in a recent paper, lead to the challenger disaster. It's, oh, well, it's not, that, it's not that big of a deal. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. And it's the accumulation of those things that lead to um, tragedy, including suicide in, in these cases. Um, and then ruined families. So, so, so our remedies are, as I said up front, uh, creation of independent IG of the of the um, inspector general. So not a not not a different lipstick for the same pig. A new pig altogether. Uh, increased oversight and accountability by Congress. Um, so they are hands on when they want to be, and then not hands on when it's not convenient, or when they've just got a whole bunch of other stuff going on. So that's part of our um, our advocacy piece. And then the final um, final two are increased and improved training and then mandatory timelines for the completion of the investigation. So that's our proposal in a nutshell. It's about 80 something pages, uh, including all the case studies, which of course for the public view, we did not include the case study because there's some, a lot of personal information in there, but we are giving those case studies to Congress. Um, and Jackie, I see you put the link up there and I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate the time to speak and uh, I'm open to any questions. Yeah, so thank you both. And, and while there isn't overhead mic announcing flights, um, any questions from the audience? I see there's been lots of interaction in the chat. Um, Francesca, I'll ask you to put your email if people want to reach out to you or to Tom, you as well, in the chat. I see Kel has been in the chat um, talking about FOIA deadlines and um, outsourcing of the DOD OIG work investigations as well. So I think we definitely have covered a lot of issues here that are important. Um, and there's so many other things that I know are coming up and, and go before Congress. We just wanted to hire a few of them. Um, I saw DJ has been making comments. I, I know we have a couple of other attorneys who have logged in. Um, if anybody else wants to join the conversation, please raise your hands and we'll try to um, get to as many questions as we can. So whatever we starts off with, people are shy. <laughs> okay, Bailey, thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, okay, I have two questions. Um, one question is, um, is there currently a federal law um, banning NDAs for whistleblowers like there is for um, sexual harassment survivors? You know, after the Me Too movement, you know, Gretchen Carlson and people like that were able to pass some legislation banning, um, you know, NDAs or um, I guess, in, I'm not sure if it's federal or state. Is there anything like that now for just other kinds of whistleblowers, like somebody who was reporting like a labor law violation or a health and safety violation. Mm -hmm. So that was my first question. And then the second one is, has anyone in any state uh, ever tried to introduce a civil right to counsel for whistleblowers? Because in California, we have a civil right to counsel if you've got an eviction case or a domestic violence case, you can get a free lawyer 
And I think that would be so great if whistleblowers had free lawyers, because then you can avoid the horrible state agencies, which all have the same problems that Francesca described in the military. That's exactly what happens to you in California. If you have to go through the Department of Industrial Relations, you've got no due process right. They often close the case after one call to your former employer. Basically, you need an attorney if you want anything done about your whistleblower case. So those are my two questions, if there's anybody that uh, knows about those. Uh, that sounds like a Tom question. Go ahead. <laughs> Other folks might have things to add, but um, I can contribute. Um, with respect to non-disclosure agreements, um, that's something we've worked on really hard and the law is strong for civil service employees, um, for federal workers. Um, it's a, an official person, issuing a gag order is an official personnel action under the Whistleblower Protection Act, which means that you can challenge it for uh, whistleblower retaliation. If a gag order was issued um, to silence you, uh, that's a violation of the Whistleblower Protection Act. Um, and even if you can't tie it to your whistleblowing, there's a second provision um, in the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act um, that um, makes it a prohibited personnel practice, a merit system violation that um, can be overturned legally through due process, um, to issue a gag order without what they call an addendum, um, a PS at the end of it. It says um, this gag order um, um, is overcome, is, is superseded, and can't contradict. Um, the Whistleblower Protection Act or the right to communicate with Congress. Um, um, and it can't be used for uh, actions against classified disclosures um, unless the information is marked secret uh, or um, it, you can have unmarked the information that's classified after the fact to go after a whistleblower. Just issuing any gag order without that addendum that neutralizes it and says that um, all the whistleblower laws trump any restrictions on speech um, is a prohibited personnel practice. Um, there's also, since 1988, been uh, an annual appropriations rider, uh, which says it's illegal to spend any federal funds to uh, implement or enforce uh, gag orders. Um, and um, anybody who does that, you can try and subject them to a salary cutoff, although it's a very convoluted process. But um, so the answer to your first question is there's basically um, three uh, ways that you can challenge a gag order under federal law. As far as the right to counsel, um, we don't have it, but we're really you know, behind the curve on that one. Uh, the European Union Whistleblower Directive for all 25 countries in that continent requires there to be free legal assistance um, for whistleblowers. And it's kind of pioneering. Uh, the EU Whistleblower Directive also puts on the list of remedies um, emotional support to deal with the psychological stress from harassment. Yeah, well, I actually um, got an attorney very late in my case. I lost all of my original rights due to expired statutes of limitations, but the organization that helped me is in San Francisco and they're trying to establish that. It's they're basically their goal. They're, it's a nonprofit that provides free civil litigation assistance to anybody who needs a lawyer who has a valid case. But without them, you know, I, I just had terrible experiences with state agencies, partially because I didn't have any legal training and I didn't know what I was doing. And I was up against a corporate legal defense firm smearing me as, you know, the worst person who ever existed. Um, yeah, so I, I would love to see that happen. And I always tell my story to their donors you know, to, to help get people to donate to this organization because it's such a terrible story. Yeah. Thank you. Bobby, what's the name of the organization? I want to Open Door it. Legal. Yeah. It's called Open Door Legal. And as far as I know, it's the first nonprofit in the country that provides civil litigation assistance. You have to be in one of the zip codes that they served. And what happened to me is they didn't open into my zip code until um, after I lost my right to sue like as a whistleblower and all the other original rights I had had. But they did help me validate, yes, these were legal violations. And they got me. Um, 10 months of unpaid overtime, which was $12,000 because they'd underpaid me by so much. So, um, you know, better than nothing. And 
Also, I didn't sign an NDA, I refused, and I can talk about my case, which is what I wanted. I wanted the right to tell my representatives what's happening to people that don't have attorneys, even when we have very strong cases by the standards of your book, which I wish I had read <laughs> four years earlier, the book that you wrote uh, on the, the Corporate Whistleblowers uh, Survival Guide. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Bailey, can you put some of that information in the chat? And then I see Kel has his hand up. So I'm gonna turn the mic over to him. Well, I'm just going to add just for some flavor so that you understand where the right to an attorney falls in at least the, the federal uh, whistleblower protection as far as federal employees. This is some of what Tom was talking about is that uh, there's a provision in the Administrative Procedure Act called 5, uh, 5 U.S.C. 555B, and it basically is this mostly non-controversial language that says if you're compelled to talk to a federal employee you have a right to have a lawyer there and this is interpreted by most agencies to mean you know if you're in an ig complaint if you're if you have an administrative hearing whatever uh if you are the tar if you're being interviewed by an oig you have this right to have a lawyer present some agencies however have taken that read have taken that statute and said but wait if you're the complainant you aren't being compelled to talk to anybody you can always choose not to talk to somebody and and have your uh, case dismissed so if i am a complainant and i file a complaint about tom and jackie is a witness to the thing I'm complaining about, Tom, according to those agencies, and CIA sort of leads the charge on this, Jackie is entitled to have a lawyer when she's interviewed by the IG. Tom is entitled to have a lawyer when he's interviewed by the IG. I am not because I'm not compelled to be there. So with, the, with this interpretation that shows no sign of going away anytime soon, we're having to get up to you have a right to have a lawyer there that you pay let alone having one sort of available for free so that's where we are that's sort of the heavy lift that we would have to do to get to where you're talking about uh francesca i see you want to make another comment and then i see joe carson has also logged in and wants to make a comment so francesca ladies first <laughs> well i think i'll actually i'll defer to Joe, because I actually had a question, not a comment, a question based on what Kel just did. I'll let, I'll let Joe go first. Okay, Joe, up to you. Okay. Um, you know, I've been in this cruel jungle for 30 years, and I'm still employed, still married, going to retire soon. Talking about nuclear weapon security, not the deep fat fry at the Burger King. I cannot be more stark about the stakes for my whistleblowing, in my opinion. All right, so the, the Department of Energy attorneys are very open about how they have weaponized legal ethics. They would say, we would be corrupt as attorneys not to cover up agency corruption. And by legal ethics, the legal, the legal profession says, that's right. Their paramount duty is to protect their client, come what may. And the legal profession, like my profession, has the privilege of self-regulation. These rules of professional conduct are, are written by the American Bar Association, which is explicit. This is a privilege. We can write our own rules. So we whistleblowers, I think, need to be going to the American Bar Association saying, stop weaponizing legal ethics to the destruction of our country. They can't blow us off. They don't claim to have the right to self-regulate. They claim it's a privilege. So um, you're, that's what you're facing. I listen to all this stuff. I keep legalizing legal ethics. The lawyers are saying we're hired guns. We're, our clients never wrong. We'll do whatever we can get away with to smash that whistleblower. It doesn't have to be that way. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Francesca and I see, um, oh, I see. Okay, so yeah, go ahead. And um, oh, I was thinking of something. Well, go ahead, Francesca, and then I see Bally. Bally wants to join back in. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, no, Kel, I was just curious. The last thing you said about the the way that the agencies have interpreted the, uh, the if you're compelled to be, and so therefore complainants do not get uh, legal representation, which which is absolutely true. We actually for that with the foundation. Um, so one of our one of our projects is we have a, a newsletter um, on um, 
primarily on LinkedIn, but also on the foundation website, Instagram, Facebook. So it's called the DOD Times Redacted. And one of our articles that we wrote, it's it a little bit, little bit joking, a little humor on that one, DOD Times Redacted. And I'll put the link on the um, in the chat. But um, with the Chevron case decision that just came down recently, is there a chance that, I mean, I know a lot of people are hanging a lot on that Chevron case decision. But is there a chance that the way that the agencies interpreted that law could 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 be argued through the courts so that complainants actually do uh, have a right to legal representation? I don't even think you need the the Chevron the, the Loper Bright case in order to get there. The problem is that it becomes very difficult to establish standing in the first place. And so you would have to, in order to bring a lawsuit to even get in front of a court, you would have to say, I tried to file a complaint and the agency said that they wanted to interview me and I insisted that I have my lawyer there. And they said, no, you're not allowed to have your lawyer there. And so I, I did not participate and then they closed the complaint because I voluntarily did not participate and therefore I am harmed by having them not investigate my complaint about misconduct because I voluntarily chose to proceed with a lawyer due to their interpretation of this law and it would be motions to dismiss after motions to dismiss for years before a court would even get to the question of reasonable interpretation. It would be like, do I have a standing to do? Was I actually harmed? You know, any of that. So this is why I haven't litigated this issue. I have wanted to litigate this issue many times, but it's practically impossible to get it in front of a court in the first place. And, and because you're basically saying that because of an ancillary procedural uh, posture that the agency took, they did not investigate your complaint fully because they did not allow you to testify the way that you wanted to. And I'm not even sure that I can prove that there's a right to be able to testify in an IG hearing in the first place, an IG investigator in the first place. That's helpful. Thank you. Sorry, a pop up. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think some of these things are some of the issues that we've really been discussing over the last um, couple of months are really quite compelling, not just for us as individuals, but for um, case law in, in general. And I know there's been a couple of other lawyers, I've seen them um, pop in and out, and people from all over the country. Um, I think some from all over the world have joined us tonight for this discussion on some of these legal issues and challenges. So well, I'm gonna remind people again, um, we're putting as many resources as we can in the chat. Please feel free to connect with each other that way. I mean, that's one of the reasons we host these round tables um, is to help people connect with each other learn from each other's stories. Um, uh, Karen asked Tom, where are we with protecting contractors from slap suits? Um, I was just in, um, in Europe, slap suits were a big issue. Tom, if you're, still, uh, if you're still with us, is there any further discussion about the protection and slap is strategic litigation against public participation, people who get sued when they um, report um, in the news, so to speak. So a lot of journalists I've heard have been slapped and other whistleblowers who have gone to the media and are not really protected as sources. So Tom, over to you on slap suits. Um, I think that's one of the most significant loopholes in American law for whistleblowers. Uh, we don't have protection against slap suits and we don't have protection against retaliatory criminal prosecutions. And both of those are, you know, they can be scarier than getting fired. Um, uh, and, and, uh, we're way behind the curve, but 
three quarters of countries globally that whistleblower laws protect against retaliatory litigation, civil or criminal. Uh, the European Union Whistleblower Directive has protection against retaliatory litigation, civil or criminal. That was in the government contractor whistleblower legislation as originally um, proposed. Um, and when I said it was almost intact, uh, it adds a, a big exception. Um, I mean, the, in the word almost, is the Republicans said they would kill the legislation if there was protection against retaliatory litigation. And in order to save all the other reforms, we didn't have any choice but to um, take that out of the bill and fight another day with it. Um, depending again on the election results, um, uh, Jamie Raskin's office was very interested um, in proposing, if we hadn't gotten it on the government contractor law, in proposing um, its, its own legislation um, to for whistleblowers to defend themselves against retaliatory litigation. Just a bill about slap suits in um, criminal retaliatory criminal prosecutions. Um, but um, whether or not that has any chance of taking root will depend on the election results this fall. So are you saying that we, um, we, I know we need to continue sort of our work with Congress and just sort of keep whoever is there informed with the idea that they may be back. Um, and oh, yes. Campaigns. But what yeah, and I, I think that it's really um, um, hard to swallow the Republican opposition to um, retaliatory civil litigation, which is speaking huge damage awards from whistleblowers because those same politicians are rapidly opposed to whistleblowers getting to file and citizens of groups getting to file um, uh, lawsuits to seek um, punitive damages from companies. But it's fine for the companies to do that against the individuals who are challenging them. Uh, so it's, it's really a shameless double standard. Um, and it's been one of my biggest frustrations. And Karen Iovino just did a, um, a comment. Karen's one of our clients at GAP, and she is a totally gutsy whistleblower uh, who is fighting a slap suit um, after the State Department Inspector General had backed her. Uh, the company still, the contractor, still pursued a slap suit against her. Yeah, we at our last conference um, at the Work Release Promise Institute last year, we had um, a young man, 15 years old, who has been hit with a slap suit because he wrote an article in his school paper about his mother. And I saw Aris Donagus logged in when we were just in Greece. We had um, journalists talking about their slap suits. One guy said that he got slapped after retweeting a story. So not even a story he wrote. Um, I don't know, Ari, if you want to Come on, I saw you just logged in, so I hate to put you on the spot, but you logged in just as we were talking about slap suits. Hi, guys. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm in my bed because it's very late for us here in Greece, but uh, I didn't want to miss this. So, yes, uh, it was actually shocking. We had a uh, prominent journalist in Greece that uh, there have been a slap suit for a couple of millions of euros. Um, and one of them, it was because he retweeted a tweet about a political scandal in Greece and he's been slapped and he's going through court. It's, it's terrible what's happening right now in Greece. But uh, if I may, I just want to discuss a, a quick a story that's just surfacing in, in Greece. And, and, and I think Tom and Jackie, who might be interested in that, we had some development with Novartis. I don't know if you're familiar with the Novartis case. Uh, the pharmaceutical company that it was, uh, we found it in, 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 in Greece, the bribing uh, uh, politicians and, and doctors. But now what happened is, in America, those Greek journalists, they got witness protection status and they were, um, they were awarded, they used the American system, they were awarded $56 uh, million dollars because you know, of your legislation that uh, can actually claim on uh, non-American soil. Now, what happened back in Greece, they're trying to lift that 
a status of uh, protection because the whistleblowers got rewarded in the states so i'm just gonna leave this with you to to digest so we have a conflict of interest and jackie this is what we discussed about you know cross-border conflict of interest of whistleblowers so the same whistleblowers they claimed both in greece and in america in america they got witness protection and a reward in greece they got witness protection but when the greeks find out that in america they got money then i want to leave the witness protection status it's crazy i thank you for that for listening all right thank you and i want to thank karen i have you know um whose case uh, related to the State Department. And I see Wanda Birkin has also put information in the chat. Um, she was a Foreign Service Officer for Department of Commerce, I believe it is. Um, and her case has been going on for a long time too. So, you know, we started off talking about DOD OIG, but the DOD OIG is very similar to a lot of the other OIGs we've had social security whistleblowers, state, commerce, um, energy. And we see that the OIGs across uh, the federal system are all fraught with problems. Um, I know we're at the top of the hour, so I just wanna thank everybody who has participated in this month's round table. I apologize that I'm in the airport and it's probably been um, a little noisy. I'm gonna let Tom Devine have the last word. I'm gonna ask Paul to put in the chat reminders. Um, next, we will do an August um, roundtable on whistleblowing, mental health, and trauma. Um, I've got a whole bunch of PhDs and social workers all lined up. So we'll, we'll talk about um, that next month. And then of course, the Workplace Promise Institute is September 12th and 13th. So please register. We'll put out a final agenda here soon. And um, Tom, over to you for the last word. Well, I'm a little embarrassed. It's um, basically a notice to my clinic students who have been attending this evening um, to accept the team's invitations because you're not through. <laughs> uh, thanks for hosting this, Jackie. It Thank you, and I, you know, I appreciate the work of the Make It Safe Coalition and everybody from the coalition. Kel is on the coalition, on the steering committee. Um, I've seen a couple of other people who I think are in the, the broader Make It Safe Coalition group who have signed on and supported us. So thank you, everybody. Um, I look forward to seeing some of you actually next, or the, yeah, next week or the coming week for um, National Whistleblower Day and some of the summit um, activities as well. So see you all soon and um, please stay in touch and keep networking with each other. So thank you. Bye, Jackie. <laughs> Cheers, Jackie. Now see you again. Yes, hope so. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.